thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you about this. So before we go through the presentation, I'd like to start by asking a couple of questions. Um, who in this room has a liver? <laughs> Let's joke everybody, right? Okay, but more seriously, like we all have a liver. It's, it's very important to our health and well-being, but it tends to be one of our most neglected body organs, and so we're going to talk about that. Uh, but how many people in this room, more seriously, have had either a negative test for liver function or have had issues with liver health, if you're comfortable sharing? So about half the room, yeah. So that's, that's a lot. And we really want to learn how we can support our body and be able to move forward. So your liver sits in your system right above your stomach. What does it do? Well, when we look at this picture, it looks kind of ugly. It's a factory. But guess what? Our liver is a factory. It is one of our largest body organs. It is responsible for over 200 different metabolic functions in our body. That's an awful lot. And it does it without us having to think anything about it. So that's kind of amazing, um, especially when we consider that most of us don't eat or do things that support optimal liver health. So the liver converts nutrients from our food in order for our body to be able to use it, but then it also takes nutrient substances and stores them in our cells. This is how our body is able to move forward when, we, when we're pulling things, extracting them out of the food. Anything that we can't use immediately is, is stored. So it works hard you know, to help us with that. But it also, more importantly, and this is the most important point that I'm going to touch on today, it supports detoxification. So like I said, it's a factory. And it detoxifies our body and helps to support our overall health and wellness by taking those toxins and converting them into something that is less harmful. And then it also helps escort these toxins out of the body. Because when toxins accumulate in the body, things get sluggish and they don't work well. It, it's kind of like if you have you know, a pipe that gets clogged with sludge. Well, eventually it's going to back up and then things get really ugly. Well, that happens in our body. And the interesting thing is sometimes you can actually see that when you see people, for example, who are very, very sick with liver issues, you'll notice perhaps that their eyes, the whites of their eyes turns squared. yellow. That's bilirubin backing up in their system and their body can't uh, you know, excrete it the way they need to. Some people, their skin will actually turn yellow. Um, and so we want to make sure that our liver is doing what we need it to do so that we can stay as healthy as possible. So this is just a few of the liver functions because, like I said, over 200, it's a lot. Purifies our blood. So 50 ounces per minute, 1.4 liters, that's more than a one liter bottle, is purified just continually by our liver. It's working really, really hard. And then it also produces bile, and we need bile in order for our body to be able to properly process fats that we take into our diet, and we also need it to help regulate our metabolism. So one of the things that happens, interestingly enough, is our gallbladder is what uses the bile. And so when we don't have a gallbladder, anybody in here doesn't have a gallbladder? And I'm in that club, by the way, unfortunately. So those who don't have a gallbladder wind up having more problems with how their body utilizes and processes bile which is important for fat metabolism, which means that we then have an impact on our liver because it, it's producing what it needs to, but it's not being utilized the way it needs to be utilized in the body. And so that is another reason why we want to be looking at how we're nourishing, how we're supporting the body so that we can support even in the absence of an important organ like the gallbladder. So um, our liver also stores minerals and fat-soluble vitamins. Those are the ones that I was saying that it saves for later for our body to be able to use. Does anybody know what the fat-soluble vitamins are? Yes? A, D, E, K. That's right. A, D, E, and K. So I say those are fat-soluble vitamins. Do you know what that means? Like what, what does it mean when you have a fat-soluble vitamin? 
Very close. So it, the answer was it can dissolve in fat. It doesn't actually dissolve in fat, but what happens is it needs fat in order to be activated. So I'm going to step aside for just a second and tell you guys that if any of you are eating fat-free food, you need to stop now <laughs> because when we eat low-fat or fat-free foods, our body doesn't get the amount of fat that it needs in order to properly activate the fat-soluble vitamins that we need for health. And, you know, more and more people are being told that they have a vitamin D deficiency. Some people, if their doctors are testing them, discover they have a vitamin K deficiency. And they're thinking, well, I drink lots of milk, you know, which has vitamin D in it or something like that. Well, the truth is we need to make sure we have sufficient levels of fat in our body in order for those vitamins to be properly used by the system and to support our health. So it also helps with protein synthesis, glycogen storage, and conversion. That's what helps with our energy. So when we get very tired, very fatigued, it may be that we're not properly converting the way we need to. It's also really important for cholesterol function. So here's the other thing I'm going to tell you. Really important because, unfortunately, you know, we go out into the world and there's all this information about how we should eat a low cholesterol diet and cholesterol is bad for us and we have to worry about our cholesterol. And part of the problem is the cholesterol that your liver makes is totally different from the cholesterol that's in your food. So we really need to know that. But the other is we have to have cholesterol. Our body needs it to make hormones. And if we don't have enough cholesterol, we're not making enough hormones. And that includes things like our sex hormones, but it also includes the hormones that are important for brain function and for metabolic function. So we really want to make sure that we're balancing that appropriately and not de you know, depleting our system by denying it those things that it needs. Now, if you're eating a diet that's very high in cholesterol and you're highly reactive to it, that's a totally different issue. That's actually a totally different talk. Um, it's also good for carbohydrate metabolism, helps to balance blood glucose levels. So people who don't have good liver function frequently also don't have good blood sugar control because their body's not balancing the way that it needs to. Protects against parasites. And we are exposed to far more parasites than we think. So our liver can, in some ways, help to filter and protect against that. Again, they're our little, our little workhorse factory. Um, and again, detoxification. So, and that's why I have that woman there with that mop. Like, our liver is our cleanup organ. And we do not, it's like the cleaning lady. But we don't give it enough respect for the hard work that it does. And we really need to pay more attention to that. So I'm going to talk about detoxification for just a minute. Um, you know, one of the things that's really important, we hear detox everywhere, right? I mean, people hear this, oh, I went on a detox, or maybe you need a detox. <laughs> what does that really mean? So first of all, I'm here to tell you that your body detoxes all by itself naturally without you having to do anything about it. Like, that's part of how it functions. If you are going to, quote, unquote, do a detox, Usually, that means cleaning up your diet by removing things like, you know, sugar, alcohol, starchy carbohydrates, that kind of thing. Possibly taking some supplements to help support, you know, your body's function. And that's supposed to be doing a detox. I am not opposed to those if you are in good health and if you do them at the right time of year. I'm here to tell you that winter wrong time to do a detox. Winter is your body's rest and restore phase. We should not ever be forcibly doing any kind of detox. The other thing I'm here to tell you is I, I have literally had people say this to me. It drives me crazy. Someone who goes, oh, I'm detoxing. I feel awful, but it's so good. No, no, wrong. It should never feel good. You might feel a little hungry if you're, you know, possibly giving up some of the things that you're craving and all the garbage that you've been eating, but you should not ever feel weak, tired, headachy, or awful when you're doing a detox. You should feel supported, and you should, your body should start to feel good. You should actually start to feel more energetic. So there's two different detoxification pathways that happen in the body. So first of all, it takes exogenous things which are from the environment 
And then it takes endogenous, which is from our body. These are the two different types of waste that it works with to escort those out of the body to help get rid of those toxins so that they don't accumulate in the system. Phase one is oxidization, or sorry, oxidation. And that's where the liver takes enzymes and ox oxygen to process those toxins and make them more water soluble. So remember, we have a lot of fat soluble vitamins, but we want them to be water soluble so they have to be converted so that they can easily be escorted out of the body. And then phase two is conjugation, and this is where the body releases the toxins by combining it with things like your urine and your bile and sulfur that comes through your system and that kind of thing. So this is where knowing that our liver is in good shape helps us. It's not like we can sit there and go, gee, I'm going to do pathway two detoxification right now. Like it doesn't work that way. But when we take care of our liver, when we are supporting our body, then those function much more cleanly and we wind up feeling better as a result. So where do the toxins come from? Like this is really, really scary stuff. We are surrounded by toxins in so many different ways. And the Environmental Working Group, which is an organization that studies this kind of stuff, um, has discovered that the average American is exposed to over 200 chemical toxins per day. Now here's a really sad side note to that. There was a scientist who wanted to do a study to find out where environmental toxin exposure came in the life cycle. So she decided she was going to study cord blood. That's the, the blood from the cord when the baby's born because it was believed at that time, was being the operative word, that babies were born pure, that the mother's placenta was so good that nothing got through. And so they tested a lot of babies and the results came back and every single one of them was contaminated. And she called the lab and she said, there's something wrong with this study. Like every single one of my subjects has toxins in their blood. And they said, yeah, we thought it was wrong too, so we re-ran it. Those answers are right. So we are all exposed from birth to massive amounts of toxins. And our body, our, our liver and our kidneys have to help us get rid of that. So that's why we want to take care of them. So these are some of the things that we are exposed to. Some of these we can control. Some of them we can't. You know, So non-organic food, well, that's definitely something that you can control. And, and I hear you. I mean, I, I get a lot of people who say to me, organic is so expensive. And so my option is find those things organic that you can afford and start there. So if you are going to choose the dirty dozen, avoiding those 12 fruits and vegetables that are more likely to be contaminated by pesticides, start there. If you are willing to buy organic dairy product and avoid the added hormones, the added antibiotics, all of the pesticide-laden feed, all of that, start there. Just pick a place and start with that because the more you do, that's one thing less that, that you don't have to worry about. Um, air pollution, we can't control that. You know, we can control it in our home. We can make sure that we have good, clean filtration systems, you know, HEPA filters and all that kind of stuff, but that a lot of that is beyond our control. And so to that, all I have to say is thank God we don't live in China because like their air is horrific over there. There are some days where people don't even see the sun and it's not because it didn't come up, it's because the smog is so bad they can't see it. It's really gross. Household cleaning products. You know, we use these products all the time because we're trying to create a clean environment. What we don't realize is a lot of these triclosan, phthalates, parabens, they're hormone disruptors, they're nanoparticles, they get into our system and then they don't leave our system very easily. And so that's where we need to start reading the label, we need to start understanding what's in these products as we're using them. Nonstick cookware. Okay, so this is where I am going to tell you, you know, I'm known as the ingredient guru. I'm all about what's in what you eat, what's on what you eat, how to be healthy, and I'm here as your cheerleader. I encourage people to take baby steps to change because I understand that it can be very overwhelming to try and do it all at once. This is one area where I will not budge. If you own nonstick cookware, I'm here to tell you, throw it out. Don't ever use your nonstick cookware again. I want you to go home, I want you to throw it out, and I want you to invest 
in a good, clean set of cookware. Because every time you cook food on a nonstick surface, it leaches into your food and gets into your body. It is not good for you. Unfortunately, I, I don't know how many people in here get my newsletter, but this week in the newsletter, I talked about the fact that we discovered that the EPA and the FDA um, colluded together, and they lied about how much these PFAs are getting into our environment and how much more we're exposed to. And it's because of the factories that are making it that are dumping this stuff in the environment. You really, really need to get rid of it. Plastics, BPA, all of that, like those are things we want to try and use as little as possible. I encourage people, as much as you can, start switching to glass. You know, one of the things that I do at home, for example, is I buy wide mouth canning jars when they go on sale at canning season, and I use those for my leftovers. They're perfect. You can either make a single meal by putting a little bit of everything in there, or you can store your leftovers in it, but then it's stored very neatly in glass, easy to see, no plastic. So that's a great change. Skincare products, this is where we need to really look at what we're putting on our skin. You know, I, I said our liver is one of our largest body organs. Our absolute largest body organ is our skin. And what we put on it can migrate into our system. And so that's why we want to be aware of that and be mindful of the things that we're using. And then our tap water, chlorine, fluoride, heavy metals, PCBs, and yes, pharmaceuticals. Um, all get into our water and then we drink them. And so learning how to figure out what the right water source is for you or how to take care of your water is another way to help reduce the toxic exposure. And so right about now, there's probably some people in this room going, right, I'm just not going to eat, sleep, breathe, or drink anymore <laughs> like I'm done. <laughs> and, and I understand how overwhelming this is. I am not here to make you feel like this is not achievable. What I want to do is I want to encourage you, those things that you can control, those things that are within your ability to make a change, make a difference, a little bit at a time, you can do it. It doesn't happen overnight, because the truth is, if you went home and said, I'm going to change everything right away, it would last about three days, and you'd be like, oh, I'm exhausted, I can't do this anymore. But one change at a time, one step at a time, supports you and your health, and it's worth it. So, signs of liver dysfunction. There are a lot of them. And here's the thing, just because if you have one of these, it doesn't mean you automatically have liver dysfunction. I'm just saying these are the things that tend to be tied to problems with the liver. So, a lot of allergies can be tied to that. Our outside, our skin, is a reflection of our inside. And so when we have dry, rashy skin, sometimes it can mean we have a dry inside. When our, when our body is not removing those toxins well enough, it's got to get rid of them somehow. Sometimes comes out through the skin. Blocked arteries, obviously, unless you're going for testing, you wouldn't know. Um, blood sugar issues can definitely be tied to that. People with chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia, remember I said that our liver, part of what it does is supports our energy production. So when we have people who have a lot of energy issues, it may actually be that they have a blocked liver, that things are not operating the way that they're supposed to. Digestive problems are huge. Fatty <coughs> liver. Fatty liver is something that a lot of people get diagnosed with. It doesn't happen overnight. It's actually a, you know, a disease of time because the liver is just accumulating more and more fat as it can't dis, you know, disengage from the things that we're taking into it. And so eventually you can potentially get diagnosed with fatty liver. The worst fatty liver diagnosis that you can get is something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Yes, I know, very technical name. Um, and that, honestly, a lot of people can get that from having a very high sugar diet that's high in fructose. So that's things like high fructose corn syrup, crystalline fructose, agave nectar, all those kinds of things. And so we want to look at how much sugar is in our diet, especially how much fructose is in our diet, and remove that in order to be able to support our liver. Um, foggy brain, headaches, hormonal imbalance, intolerance for fats, uh, alcohol or caffeine, low energy, mood swings, obesity, unbalanced fat, all of that is tied to our liver. And so when we start getting some of these tests back and we see that maybe things aren't where they need to be, 
that's when it's time to maybe check in with yourself and see if, if you can do some things to help balance better. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as I mentioned just a moment ago, is one of the top causes of st systemic inflammation. And it's really very um, difficult because it's frequently tied to obesity and type 2 diabetes as well. Um, so one of the things we want to watch out for, as I said, is how much fructose is in the diet because there's far more than we realize. You know, in the beginning, when high fructose corn syrup first came out, they put it on the front of the label. They were like, yay, like it's, it's got this sugar in it and it's great. And then they discovered it wasn't so great. So then we had all those stupid commercials, you know, the ones I'm talking about where two people and someone goes, want a popsicle? And the other person goes, no, it's got high fructose corn syrup. And the first person goes, yeah, what's wrong with high fructose corn syrup? And the other person goes, oh, like they didn't know. <laughs> And now we know, we have studies that show that too much fructose is not good for your liver. So we definitely don't want to eat it. So now they hide it in things. They, don't, they, they put it in tiny print on the back in the ingredient panel. So you've got to read the ingredient panel to see where it is. Um, and the other two high fructose ingredients that they don't like to tell you about, one is agave nectar, which is being sold as a low glycemic sweetener. Yes, it's low glycemic, but the way it's processed, it's very high fructose. High fructose corn syrup is approximately 55% fructose by volume. Agave nectar is approximately 70%, so it's more. The absolute worst one is crystalline fructose, and I absolutely hate that name. I'm so sorry that they were allowed to call it that because it sounds so benign. Crystalline, crystal, fructose, fruit sugar. Oh, that doesn't sound so bad. Well, what it is really is dehydrated high fructose corn syrup. It's 90% fructose by volume. And non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is found in nearly 30% of the adult population of the United States, including as much as 11% of overweight children. That this is not acceptable. We have to change how we eat and how we nourish our bodies because for those babies to have that at that age is wrong. And for adults to have to deal with the consequences of that is not a great idea. That's not the life you want. And I, I want you to be healthy and vibrant. So these are a few products that I just wanted to show you because they all have high fructose, sorry, they all have crystalline fructose in them. So Fuse is, you know, one of these drinks that's out there. And they use crystalline fructose because I guess people think it's a good thing. Newberries, and I specifically looked up the ingredients in Newberries just to make sure, because there are a lot of these companies out there. This is one of those make your own you know, yogurt sundae places where you go in, you serve the yogurt, and then you go to the candy bar, top it up, and then you pay by the ounce. You have to ask them what the ingredients are in there. They don't make it very easy to find. Newberries is one that definitely does. I don't know if any of the others do because I didn't track them all down. So that's where you'd have to ask at your local, whether it's tutti frutti or orange leaf or whatever they are. <clears throat> Vitamin water, crystalline fructose. And then, believe it or not, they actually sell crystalline fructose by the box. <laughs> so not sure why. So liver issues for the Turner syndrome population. You know, one of the things I love about coming to talk to you guys is you want the science. You guys are so active, so smart, and so engaged in your own healthcare. You want to know what it's all about. And so that forces me to do the research, which is great, because I love it. So liver involvement in Turner syndrome. Um, and this appeared in the Liver INT Journal. I don't know what INT stands for, probably international, uh, back in 2013 in January. Um, Dr. Roulat was the lead researcher. So liver test abnormalities are frequent in adult patients with Turner syndrome. So here's the thing. Liver issues are not, to the best of my knowledge, at the same level as some of the other issues such as heart malformations or, you know, there are some things where if you have Turner syndrome, you are on the watch for these things because they are so strongly correlated that, you know, the vast majority of the population has them. This is not one of those things. This is not where if you have Turner syndrome, you are guaranteed that you're going to have liver problems. But what it means is there is more of a propensity for it simply because how the body processes all the other metabolic things that have to happen means that we have a higher risk. 
architectural changes are associated with vascular disorders caused by congenitally abnormal vessels. So there can be some congenital malformation in the system. And I'm here to tell you that even if you have congenital malformation of liver vessels, these are the things that are feeding your liver, bringing the blood supply in and out, it does not mean that you can't still nourish your liver. You can love your liver at any time because that's how you feed your body and your liver. And so just because there are some potential abnormalities doesn't mean that we give up and, and don't look at how to nourish. And then small bile duct alterations resembling sclerosis, sclerosing cholangitis occur in several patients. So that, what that means is that the bile duct did have um, some buildup and some thickening uh, sclerotic behavior. And you know, again, that's something that can happen, but it doesn't mean that you don't still want to feed your body and take care of your lifestyle in a way that supports liver health. Serum liver enzymes in Turner syndrome. So weight excess was significantly higher in girls with liver enzyme increase. You know, and that's kind of a double-edged sword because I think it's sort of a chicken before the egg thing. Which which one came first? I don't really know. But you know, there does appear to be a correlation, and so we do want to watch out for that. The association with weight excess seems the most frequent cause of liver disorder in Turner syndrome. And so what that tells me is that one of the absolute best things that you can do for yourself is learn how to eat right for your bio-individual body and learn how to be as healthy as you can be by choosing those foods that are going to provide the nutrients that your body needs and being mindful of the impact that diet can have on your system, your weight, and your organs. So what a healthy liver can do for you? A lot. <laughs> Um, we have better digestive function, clearer skin, who doesn't love that? We have fewer infections, improved bowel health, believe it or not, fresher breath. When your liver's backing up, things don't smell so good in your system because things are maybe fermenting or decaying in there and it comes out in your breath. So we do, we do look at that as well. We can have increased energy levels, positive mood, clearer thinking, reduce or remove sinus pain, and definitely also have a stronger immune system. So those are all things that we want, and, and that, again, is another reason why we look to make those changes. So top tips to love your liver. Liver-loving foods. We want to love our liver, and in order to do that, we have to feed it things that it likes. And one of the biggest things that we can do is have cruciferous vegetables. And these are actually good not just for the liver, they're good for the rest of us too because they help with, with bowel health and they have phytonutrients that are very, very supportive for our immune system to help our gut, to help increase our intestinal activity so that we have better, um, better probiotic status. So that's a really great thing. Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, those are really yummy. And if you don't like them, my suggestion to you, because I do sometimes, I get people who are like, I hate cabbage. I'm like, okay, well, if you hate cabbage, do you like any of the other things on this list? Like, it doesn't have to be just cabbage. But if you really hate this entire class of food, my suggestion to you is that you consider trying steaming them and making them very soft and getting used to that. In a rare example, like with some kids, sometimes we do have to resort to uh, greens powder, but honestly, the absolute best thing you can do is eat them. So I would encourage you to, to just try it. Learn to make a change. Fiber, fiber is also very important, again, for bowel health. And one of the things that happens is when we eat fibrous things, it provides something called prebiotics. These prebiotics are the food of the probiotics that live in our gut. And so we want to make sure that they're happy too. As a matter of fact, one of my mentors, Liz Lipsky, refers to our intestinal flora as our pets. If we take care of our pets, they take care of us. So we want to feed them, and they like fiber. And so that would be things like kidney beans, lentils, you know, all kinds of legumes, and then vegetables like sweet potato, the fruits that are a little more fibrous, and then raw nuts and seeds. Raw is super important. 
When we have roasted nuts and seeds, when they are cooked in oil and then salted, a lot of their enzymes are broken down and destroyed. And so that means that those nutrients are not as available to our body because they're not, they're not in there anymore. But when we have raw nuts and seeds, they wind up being much more available to us because they haven't been broken down by the roasting process. The optimal one, and I give you a recipe for this in the resource guide, the optimal thing is to actually soak them. That causes a sprouting action. And the reason for that is because nuts, seeds, legumes, beans, all those kinds of things have a coating on them. It's invisible to the naked eye. It's called phytic acid. And the phytic acid is there to protect them until it's time for them to start growing, until conditions are right. The challenge is phytic acid prevents our body from getting all of the nutrients that are in the things that we're trying to eat. And when we soak them, we remove that phytic acid coating, and then we get more nutrition. So that's a great choice. The other thing, our body, our liver needs protein. And it doesn't mean that you have to, I mean, are there any vegetarians in here? Oh, no vegetarians, okay. Um, so we'll skip that part. Um, so healthy proteins, <laughs> free range eggs. And the reason we want free range, like I'm here to tell you, chickens are meant to live in the sunshine and run around and eat, well, scratch in the dirt and eat bugs. And that's when they do that, they make healthier eggs. So free range pastured eggs are the best option for us. If you can't get them at your local market, um, I suggest making friends with a farmer or finding a friend who raises chickens or whatever, but just try and get them. Sustainably raised pastured meats, wild caught fish, those kinds of things are great choices for protein. Leafy greens. I love leafy greens. I think they're amazing. And one of the things that's really great about them is they're so versatile. You can do so many different things with them but we need more of them in our diet. You know, the truth is the average adult human being, and this is, this is a very generic statement here because there's a, a big difference between someone who weighs 105 pounds and someone who weighs 195 pounds. But I'm just saying the average adult should be having approximately two to three cups of dark leafy greens a day. A day! And most of us don't do that. Now, having said that, if you're going to have, let's say you decide you're gonna have some collard greens with dinner, your amount is what it was before you cooked it. Because it starts like this, and by the time you're done cooking, it's about that much. <laughs> and so we count the pre-cooked value as how many you're having. One of my favorite ways to incorporate them is to throw them into a smoothie. I mostly do this with, um, with the kale and the spinach, um, or baby greens. I'll throw those in. When you throw them into a smoothie, I promise you it makes the ugliest smoothie you've ever seen, especially if there's blueberries in there. It's just gross. It tastes fine, though. You can't taste them. It just looks sort of like Shrek. I don't know. It's gross. Um, and then the other thing that is really important is probiotic-rich foods. Now, do we? who in here eats like lacto-fermented foods? Kombucha, so a few hands going up. So kombucha, kimchi, live sauerkraut, cultured veggies, those kinds of things are really, really good for us. And the reason for that is they have live probiotics. And so when we drink them, our body gets that sort of fresh infusion, that benefit of having added um, cultures in our system. The one thing that's really important though is if you're not used to drinking them and you think, well, that sounds pretty good. I mean, it's fizzy, it's a little bit sweet, and it's, it's kind of nice. Like, don't go out and drink an entire bottle all at once because you'll overwhelm your system. So you really want to start small, you know, a couple ounces at a time and then work your way up from there. Liver-loving beverages. This is important, too. Apple cider vinegar is phenomenal. It helps to balance our body's pH levels, and that helps make things run better. With apple cider vinegar, you really do want to get the raw stuff, though. You want to get the one that says it with the mother. It's got this blobby little thing hanging out in the bottom of the bottle. But that is what makes it have all of that beneficial live enzyme activity. 
so how do you add apple cider vinegar? Well, I've given you a drink in a uh, recipe in the resource guide, but I'll tell you really quickly, you take a little bit and you add it to some water, add a little bit of lemon juice if you want, add a pinch of cinnamon, and it's delicious. For those in the room who happen to have diabetes, this apple cider vinegar drink actually also helps to reduce what's called postprandial glucose, meaning how fast and high your blood sugar rises after you eat. If you have an apple cider vinegar drink 15 minutes before you eat, it will help reduce your blood sugar after you eat. Now, if you ate a bag of M&Ms, it's not gonna help that much, but if you're eating a healthy meal, it can help balance your blood sugar. Cran water. Cranberries are amazing. They are high in antioxidants. They have tons of phenols in them. Our body loves them because it's very, very supportive. And so to make cran water, you basically take seven ounces of water, one ounce of cranberry juice, mix them together and sip on that, you know? And that's a great, a great way to incorporate it into your diet. You want to make sure that you're having Sure, so it's seven ounces of water and one ounce of cranberry juice. But what you want to do is you want to make sure that you are getting 100% cranberry juice. I will be the first person to line up and tell you cranberry juice cocktail is not cranberry juice. We want the really sour, puckery, stringent tasting juice. That's why we mix it with water, because it doesn't taste good by itself. Green tea, especially matcha tea, is really fabulous. It has catechins in it, and these help to reduce inflammation in the liver. So if you haven't tried matcha tea, I would love to encourage you to try it. If you don't like matcha tea, and some people don't, it has a much greener, grassier flavor than regular green tea, then just have the regular green tea. But you, you know, adding a couple of glasses of this a day to your diet is very supportive for you. Kombucha, we talked about a moment ago. This is a fermented tea, and so it's really a wonderful choice. And then nourishing broth. This is essentially soup, the way your grandma used to make it, where she threw the bones and the innards and the everything in the pot and let it cook overnight, strained it out, and then used that as soup. Phenomenal for us. It is so healthy and so nourishing, and I do give you a recipe in the, in the handbook herbs for liver support. So most of us don't use as many spices as we should in our diet. Part of the problem is, you know, in America, we have a few favorites that we like. And, and I'm not saying that everybody in this room, there may be some people who are like, well, but I use this or I use that. And that's great. And I want to encourage you to incorporate more into the diet. But the truth is most of us are basil, oregano, and parsley people. <laughs> and that's it. And there are so many other wonderful flavors and spices out there. They, they make our food taste interesting, and they help to nourish our body. And that's what we're looking for is that nourishment. So one of the things we want to do is make sure that we're increasing glutathione, which is an antioxidant that our body absolutely needs in order to function well. And we also want to decrease inflammation. And so that's where we look at turmeric and coriander. Parsley's great, cilantro's great, oregano is good. And for parsley and cilantro, those are actually highly detoxifying as well. And so my suggestion to you is if you already use either, any of those in your diet, use them fresh and double what you're already using. Like if you're putting parsley on top of a dish, like mince it up, take the whole bunch, put it in there and toss it in. You know, I mean, use a lot of it. Get used to that wonderful flavor and allow your body to utilize those benefits. Liver boosting herbs that remove toxins. And again, increase glutathione. Milk thistle, holy basil, dandelion, nettle, and chicory. And so that's part of why I passed out those samples of the dandelion tea. When we incorporate dandelion, either as a green or as a beverage, we're helping to support our body. Same thing with nettles. Um, chicory is also wonderful. I don't know if anybody from Louisiana in here. So, no? Okay, so people in Louisiana are used to drinking chicory. They mix it with their coffee. Um, holy basil, a lot of people in this country, we mostly wind up taking it in tea form. And uh, milk thistle is also something where you, uh, a lot of people will take it supplementally um, because it's, it's rather strong tasting, so they don't tend to like it as a tea. So now we're gonna talk about lifestyle. You know, here, here's the thing. I talk a lot to people about how to eat and what to eat, 
and things that are good for different body systems or different health conditions. You know, my goal is to support you and your health by finding food-based solutions that you can incorporate. But that's really only one piece of the puzzle. Because the truth is, we also need to make sure that we are leading a holistically whole life, balanced life, so that we're supporting all aspects of our being and that we are able to let our body do what it's designed to do, let it function the way that it's supposed to. It doesn't do very good for us to eat well if we're living an unhealthy lifestyle. So we really want to make sure that we're doing all of it together. Does that make sense? Some heads nodding? Okay. So one is infrared sauna. Infrared sauna is an absolutely amazing thing. There are an awful lot of studies on what's called far infrared light, and it shows that this supports the body for a lot of different things. It does support detoxification, which is great. Infrared is also highly helpful and useful for people who have pain. It's great for pain management. Um, part of that is because of the effects that it has for reducing inflammation. It can also be supportive for people with anxiety, depression, attention-related disorders. That far infolight spectrum is very, very supportive for us. And so that's one of the reasons we try to incorporate it. Part of the challenge, how do you find it? Where do you find it? Well, there, uh, you know, I don't know where everybody lives, so I'm just going to throw a few things out here. And you know, hopefully you can find it. Um, Part of it means that you may, you may have to look for it. So there are some places that offer infrared therapy. For example, there are some gyms or some clubs and spas where you can have a membership that allows you to use their infrared you know, th sauna or therapy. Um, Costco actually sells an infrared sauna that you can put in your home that holds two people. Um, it's about $2,000, so it's not cheap but you can actually buy a sauna and put it in your home. The other thing that you can do, there are a number of companies out there that sell mats, infrared mats, where you can put them down, you either lie on them or you sit on them and they release the infrared light. So there's a number of different options out there. It's just a matter of doing research for where you are, what your local area is and what they provide. Castor oil. So castor oil is something that has been around for thousands of years. And, uh, your grandma used to use it. Yeah, and it's really helpful for detoxification. It's great for pain. It's great for reducing inflammation. It's a really phenomenal healthcare strategy that we've kind of forgotten about in this country. And so one of the things that you do is you, you basically get some castor oil, put it on a cloth, and then put it on your body, and then you sit, you put it on your skin. So usually if, if it's your liver that you're concerned about, you put it on the liver area. If it's your gut, you put it on the gut. And essentially what you're doing is you're going to sit there and allow it to soak into your system and help you. I have even had people tell me that they felt like they were getting sick and they did a castor oil treatment and they felt better. Like they felt like they never got whatever the bug or ick or whatever it was that was going around was. I do know that for inflammation and for pain, it is very, very helpful. So that's a good thing. And it's not that expensive. Lymphatic massage. This is a special kind of massage, so you do have to go to someone who is certified in lymphatic massage. And essentially what they're doing is moving the lymphatic fluid around in the body by specific pressure. There are some kinds of lymphatic massage that you can do for yourself. And there's videos on YouTube for things like that. So if you have congested sinuses, you can actually do specific acupressure treatment to massage that lymphatic pathway and help drain all that fluid. You can also do the neck and things like that. But it's really hard to do that for a whole body, and you can't reach your back yourself, obviously. So um, those are things where you would want to look for a practitioner. Oh, OK. Um, Yoga is another thing that's very, very helpful. There are a number of yoga poses that are very supportive specifically for the liver. Now, here's the deal. I know that different people have different types of flexibility. Um, some people have different amounts of pain, and so reaching certain positions is difficult for them. 
My suggestion for you is if you have some kind of a yoga studio near you, you could even consider just booking a session with the yoga teacher and saying, I want to learn how to do these types of exercises to support my body. Can you help me figure out like how to make an accommodation or how to do this so that I can incorporate it into my, into my healthcare routine? So I will tell you these four yoga poses here, seated torso twist, cat pose, downward facing dog, and reclining hand to big toe pose, when done, it can all be done in less than 10 minutes. So if you have 10 minutes to do like a little bit of yoga in the morning, it's actually really good for flexibility, for balance, for stretching, and hey, it helps to support the liver. So that's a great thing. Stress. We forget about stress so much because we are living this high-paced, high-action lifestyle, and we think, oh, you know, I'll just get through this, and then everything will be okay. But then you get to the other side of whatever that stress is, and there's another stressor, and we think, oh, I'll just power through it. It'll be okay. And we eventually wind up exhausting ourselves. We have to learn to reclaim self-care time. We have to learn how to make sure that we are making time to take care of ourselves and nurture our bodies. And so part of that is looking for things that we can do that will help us to de-stress. Because when we are under high stress, our body produces cortisol, and that cortisol in turn causes inflammation, and that inflammation goes where? The liver, that's right. <laughs> That's what we're talking about, people. <laughs> it goes to the liver. You know, and, and we have this thing called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. It runs through our body. Hypothalamic pituitary adrenal. Well, adrenals are right here, actually. Um, that's impacted by stress. And so when we get stressed, our HPA starts to cascade downward, and then our liver goes, oh, wait a minute, I'll be the I'll help. And then the liver winds up getting caught up in it as well. So we really, we, like all of our body organs, respond when we're stressed. And when we can learn how to take that break and how to let go and soothe ourselves, even just for two minutes, like I'm here to tell you they have done scientific studies. People who sat and did nothing more than focus on breathing in and out for two minutes lowered their blood pressure and lowered their cortisol levels. Is that not freaking amazing? Um, stress relieving activities benefit us mentally, physically, and emotionally. You know, so what's the right one for you? I have no idea. Different people have different tolerance for different things. Like I'm one of those people, I'm, those of you who know me, I'm a fairly high energy person. I cannot sit there cross-legged and, you know, going oh for 20 minutes, like it drives me nuts. But I can do guided meditation. I love those. I have several guided meditations that I absolutely adore. I have physical med meditations, walking meditations that I do. Um, journaling is another great thing. Adding in a gratitude practice. Gratitude is one of the most amazing things. The more you take the time to incorporate gratitude in your life, the more you discover you have to be grateful for. For example, I'm really grateful to that guy in that gorgeous orange shirt. That's an amazing shirt. It's so beautiful, you know? Or we look at the lights and we think, wow, look at this. This is incredible. We, these tiny moments are all around us. And we're so busy wailing through them that we forget. So when we take that time to stop, and how much gratitude? Well, my suggestion is, if you don't have much time, two minutes. Three in the morning, three gratitudes in the morning, three gratitudes at bedtime. It takes one minute each time to write that down, and then you're good to go. Breathing exercises, listening to calming music, and then the other is learning how to let it go. You know, one of the things that we don't realize is every time we hold on to stuff, our body has to store it somewhere. It stores it in our tissues. So if by the end of the day you're still pissed off at the person who cut you off at the light at 8 o'clock in the morning, like, <laughs> I'm here to, and I know that happens, so, like, don't tell me it doesn't. Like, you, you know, you come home, you say, you know, there was a sky this morning, and you're telling your spouse, hey, it was, like, I had the right away. Like, don't hang on to that. Let it go. Go, you're an idiot. And just, and, and then you're done, you know? So we, we have to learn how to let some of this stuff go so that we can calm down so that our body can run more smoothly, more optimally. And 
Move it, move it, move it. People, we are too sedentary in our modern life. We need to get out there. Our bodies are designed to be physical, to be active, to be moving. And so I want to encourage you to do whatever you can do to be active. So, you know, the general guidelines are 30 to 45 minutes, three to five minutes a week. Low, low in intensity aerobic exercises is a great place to start. You know, I'm, I'm not expecting everyone to go out there and become an extreme athlete. I don't, I don't want you to, you know, run 100 miles. I don't want you to do a marathon or a triathlon unless that's something that you want to do. But if you are someone who is not moving your body at least three times a week, I'm here to tell you, please, love your liver, love your body, love your life, and get out there and move. Do something, anything. So there's a whole bunch of exercises there for you. So in summary, we want to nourish our body with liver-supported foods. We want to choose the best quality we possibly can whenever we can. We want to add liver-loving herbs to our diet, a whole lot of those. We want to reduce sugar consumption, especially fructose. We want to increase consumption of liver-supportive beverages, add lifestyle changes to support your liver health, stress less. You can do it, I promise. And get active. Move your body to increase circulation. So love your liver, and it will love you back. And you will feel so much better for it. So this is me. I would love to encourage you to take a picture of that slide because I am very active on social media and if you reach out to me, I will reach out to you. As a matter of fact, so here's the thing, if, if I said anything, if you have a snippet or a nugget or a factoid or anything that I gave you, if you want to share that on social media and tag me, I will tag you back because I would love if we can spread the message of liver health and liver love. So thank you all for giving me your time.